Thank you, Patricia and Ensley, for two beautiful talks. Uh, I would like to say a few things, a few thoughts, uh, before I open the floor for other uh, questions. Uh, you know, when Ensley ended her lecture, and Patricia, you started yours, you somehow draw us to believe in democracy, in a way, to dream democracy. And you started where uh, the dream of democracy died. And I think that this, uh, uh, and I'm sure that we can even say that it didn't die only in 73, it died much earlier, several times. And you nonetheless resuscitated democracy as something that we can still dream about with all the apparatus that you mobilize. So I thought to flag out this, I think it's an interesting uh, 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 difference between the papers, but there is nonetheless maybe something that tie the papers, which is not that tying the papers is a challenge, but I think that as we have this kind of a commitment to retouch or repair operations, I think that the question of that is nonetheless something that is in common in the two papers, because otherwise equality will not be a project, it will be assumed as existing. So there is a kind of that. So um, I would like, uh, Patricia, in the, the spirit that you had also to refer to previous uh, 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 lectures from, uh, from today and yesterday, I would like to ask you, uh, uh, one of the many questions that I would like to ask you about actually imposing transaction in order to imagine reparations. And I'm referring, of course, to Emily's lecture from yesterday, how imposing transaction is exactly in order to erase a debt. Uh, so if you can reflect a little bit about this, because without imposing this transaction that Europe owes Latin America, we cannot think about reparations. And, and as we uh, mentioned the term of reparations and the uh, connotation that you brought uh, 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 to this term uh, through the list that I was unable to read, uh, may, maybe many, many others, but you spoke about how that is related to the state or to kind of also accountability to those from whom it was taken. And I'm just thinking about reparations as something that imperial powers uh, 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 took for themselves from all, not only in terms of the silver that they took from uh, different places and all the other resources that they extracted, but they also taxed them for reparations for their cost of occupying them. So if you can reflect a little bit about the, the uh, reversal of transaction in uh, this context. And uh, and so I would like to ask you, um, um, in relation to this dream of democracy, and assuming that you, uh, 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 you have this notion of that at the background of it, uh, uh, you spoke about equality, but actually you started with equity. And I ask myself, where did you leave equity in your trajectory toward this dream of uh, 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 citizenship? Uh, sorry, this dream of democracy. And speaking about uh, citizen or uh, citizenship, and uh, I would like to ask you, what about those who do not want to en be enlisted as citizens in democracy? I'm thinking about indigenous in different places. I'm thinking about those who were forced even not to be enlisted into this project, like non-citizens and refugees, etc. And there was also some, and I would like to, to ask you also, will the answer will come from this diagonal uh, that you draw, not diagonal, sorry, triangle. This triangle between institution intentions and material goods that you uh, draw in relation to speak about uh, equity. Material goods, intention, and institutions. I think that this was the triangle with which you started uh, when you called us to imagine uh, the pictures that we didn't see. Um, and uh, Patricia, I would like to, uh, uh, to ask you about uh, interest rate, interest rate in relation to reparations. Assuming that Transaction is necessary in order to reverse the direction and to uh, uh, make Europe accountable for its crimes. How, how would you calculate interest rates that are not monetary? <laughs> well, I mean, the short answer is I don't know. Um, the long answer is, you know, I mean, reparations is a really interesting word, right? Like, what, 
I mean, what can what can be repaired or not repaired? I, I don't think I move to the transactional model easily or normally. So it's kind of odd for me to make this claim that sort of hinges on an ironic transactional repair, right? Um, but as the sort of, I guess, as the sort of inspiration, like the text of the inspiration for the conference, right? Like, it's like we have to do that first to get to whatever's, whatever's next. So in some ways, I think it's a, an unrepayable debt. Like it can never be repaired. You can, you can never pay it back, right? Um, and maybe, and maybe the, the paying it back or the, the performative play of pretending to pay it back um, is just a way of ironizing and undoing the naturalization of the language of financial capital, right? So, um, like, the language of finance capital is, is ridiculous. So it's like pointing out the ridiculousness of the language of finance capital. Um, but in some way, right, um, it's like it's 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 a desire. It's just a, it's a desire to to think through the the cancellation of that debt. And I'm I'm very careful. A lot of people use this word debt forgiveness, which I I hate because I'm like there's nothing to be there's nothing to be forgiven. So part of me is just pushing against. I think pushing against that. Um, so I guess in that sense is kind of uh, where I would go with that. I don't know if I'm answering your question. I realize. Um, but I, I'm very interested in, in cancellation or getting rid of debt or just admitting that it's not legitimate. I mean, there are these very like much more poli sci, um, like economic um, justifications for odious debt that are really interesting, and it does have to do with interest rates, um, which is, for example, when people bar when countries were borrowing money to just pay back more money and the money never actually enters the country. It's just being given to pay back, like basically interest on the original loan. Then there are people who make the legal argument that because that money never entered the country, that it's illegitimate debt and the country does not have to pay it back. So there's actually like a very real legalistic argument for not paying it back because the currency actually never, it never entered the country in the first place, right? So I know that's a roundabout way of responding to you, but maybe that's all. Thank you for your question, um, Ariella. And um, yes, this I gave a meandering talk, and you're asking me to connect the dots. Um, so uh, the first thing that I will say is that um, what happens to equity on this story is that I want to sort of decenter it as the champion. Right, and so, um, and also I think that any question around equity, around distribution of resources um, can be better guided if we think about equality. And in terms of equal standing among citizens, in terms of uh, the, the capacity, uh, uh, sort of uh, the wielding of the sort of equal power. And those are the kinds of questions that get put on the table when we're thinking about equality as um, democratic theorists that I think that we ought to retain and um, to at least think around. Now, there, I mean, the discussion um, with regards to Pettit and Urbanati in a lot of ways was to basically reveal the tensions in all of that. Um, at some point, um, Pettit is sort of appealing to the rule of law, appealing to rational deliberation as the ground that is going to protect us from tyrannical majorities. And it doesn't work, right? Because the rule of law is dependent upon um, norms, civil norms in order to back it. Um, and then we, but, but then we also say these laws are supposed to um, influence the civil norms, right? Um, so there's this like feedback loop. Then there's also democracy as a project of equality that can see to also these, you know, majorities um, who can use the freedoms of equality to subvert it, right? And I want to, I mean, I think that these are real problems, but then I turn to Arendt to su suggest that the sort of taking down of the system itself too presents its own problems and I think this is something that I um, want to put on the table too, that a lot of times we think about the state as you know, outside 
of the people that constitute the body politic. And in some rare, very real ways, that's the case. But how do we think about the ways in which the people that are a part of body politics um, are in relationship to that state? That's another question that I think equality helps us think about or sort of puts on the table. Um, in terms of, oh, citizenship. So I think about citizenship in the more robust way that Pettit does, if I was going to evoke it at all. Um, and that's with regards to anybody who is living in the country and is, in, uh, is uh, impacted by collective decision making. So it's, it goes beyond sort of like a birth rate, you know, birth sort of citizenship or a naturalization citizenship. It's about, uh, you know, it, it extends to permanent residence, et cetera. Now, of course, whenever you start talking about citizenship nations, a political inside, there's a political outside. And so if we talk about equality amongst those who are thought about in the inside, I think that that raises the question about our relationship to an outside, right? And I think also questions about equality um, within a nation, um, the integrity of those kinds of relationships actually also um, are impacted by how, by how you sort of deal with an outside. And so that's another thing that my work in general is really struggle or tries to grapple with the ways in which racism shapes law, right? And in some ways, um, or domination or relations of domination shape law. In some ways, people would say that would that's grounds for um, revealing how you know, flimsy it is to even appeal to or to have it in place. And I want to sort of resist that move to suggest that there's something like, even if you were to get rid of sort of like these um, really pernicious, this pernicious sort of structural apparatus that we, you know, might sort of think about as doing a lot of the work, well, what is left? The ways, like, the way people organize and think about each other and in relationship to each other don't just evaporate. And those things, I think, live and imbued um, in our relationships to each other. And so if we're going to think about what it looks like to live in human community, right? We have to be amongst each other. Then these kinds of questions about like how we have, like what does it look like to relate to each other in any kind of common enterprise and living of life and human flourishing. Um, and, and those are the kinds of things that I do think that equality helps us think about in helpful ways, so. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you for these two talks. My question is for Patty. So as you were talking um, and citing these wonderful texts, I just love the Cecilia Vicuña piece. It's stunning to listen to. Um, I couldn't help but think about Haiti, as I often do uh, in general, but not only what's happening in Haiti right now, it has been for almost a year, right? The incredible protests against issues that are very related to debt, right? And international impositions, Venezuelan oil, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then also, debt in relation to Haiti that goes back from its very inception, right? The nation of Haiti upon creation in order to um, attempt a semblance of global recognition all the way back in 1804 when most of the surrounding region was slaveholding, right? Um, France imposed a debt on it to sort of pay for its freedom, which is like shockingly perverse. Um, and then also the language uh, among African diaspora scholars, Haitian people and scholars, et cetera, the reminder of France needs to pay that back with interest sometimes, <laughs> with interest, right? And then I'm just also thinking about then the concept of the afterlives of debt in that way of like, that's a really old debt that continues to live on. Then the zombie flash mob in Chile, I don't know. I don't know if I have a question except have you thought about the Chile protests, which I know you, you, I like how you traced it back, right? At least as far back as the 1970s. Um, if you had a chance to think about 
how it relates to what's happening in Haiti or something akin to that? Yeah, I mean, um, I have. I mean, I, I didn't talk about it here. I mean, it's interesting because Tavi and Yongo, of course, talks about the sort of Afro-diasporic frame of thinking about thriller, but he really does it in, about zombies actually, but he really does it in relationship to Occupy, but he doesn't look at the Chilean case. And there's some, there's some buried dealing with Afro-diasporic legacies in Vicuña's poem actually that I didn't read because it's a much longer poem. So, I mean, on some sense, yes. And I think that, I think that the Chilean use of it has to be interrogated for its actual erasure and not dealing with the Afro-diasporic legacy that I think it's, it inevitably cites on some level. And, you know, the fact that the Chilean protests are getting, um, not as much as the Hong Kong protests, but that they're getting so much, um, um, recognition in the press, like we have to think about why that is, and part of it is the way that U.S. money is tied up in this sort of idea of Chile, right, as the sort of um, mer the Chilean miracle, which is like a disaster, right? Um, so in that sense, I want to acknowledge that that sort of piece of it, but I do think that these longer histories of debt in which people who have been colonized are asked to pay back to the colonizer debt at the same time that the debts that are probably unpayable that the colonizer imposed through violence to the formerly colonized nations never ever gets recognized. Do you know what I mean? So I, I think it's actually, there's like something much more complex there and there's this moment in, the, in, in Vicuña's work, which I love, but there's, a, there's a, a moment I have to sift through a little bit in another part of the poem where she talks about watching Ali, the movie Ali, um, because it's around the same time almost. And she talks about how as a Chilean, as someone who imagined themselves as subordinate to US capital, how she's like, oh, you know, I watched Ali. We used to think we were black and we learned that we were not black. So it's like her confrontation with US forms of racialization that she actually narrates in a really interesting way. But that's also embedded in the poem and I didn't get to that, but I actually think it's, I, like in a longer version, I would have to tease that out in really important ways. Um, my question is for Ainsley, although I really enjoyed both of your papers and um, I found them both generative separately and together. Um, Ainsley, I think that my question stems from just like the contrast of a kind of optimism around democratic norms that seems fundamental to a discussion of equality that seems in contrast to um, other kinds of themes that have been present in the last two days around refusal of the state um, and and I think often like negotiation of a of, of a shared sense of illegitimacy in the, in the state, but maybe inevitability or at least constancy presence of stateness. So I'm, I'm interested in the kind of optimism of, of returning to a concept like equality as a pathway forward. Um, and I think I was, I'm really struck by your use of the common good. And I just wanted to hear you talk more about how that concept operates in political theory and how, it, how you think it as someone who's coming to equality with a kind of critical and historical stance. Um, I was thinking about, um, there's this um, Pablo Neruda poem that ends, um, it's about January and how at the, end of, at the end all will be clean again and there will be fresh bread on the table. And I sort of feel like, like the notion of um, equality as a starting point, um, seems very much in tension with Patty's kind of um, revelation of the present, the ever presence of all of debt in all of these different sort of forms, legitimate or illegitimate, right? Legitimate in the form of um, the colonized responding to the colonizer and saying, actually you owe us. So in any case, the point is um, just, I wanted to hear you think more about the common good and, and um, I'm wondering, I guess, if the common good presumes that the co that there is a common that is that we can agree on, or that like that that there is some kind of community in which um, the needs of one actually fulfill the needs of the other. Because I think, but my presumption is that I mean, I say this to my students all the time about slaveholders, right? The needs of slaveholders are very much in contrast with and 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 understood as. The, as, as a good, right? Like they, they know what they want and they get what they want and they're very much in contrast with the needs of enslaved people. And so 
I just wonder if, if you're ushering us into a vision of community that, in which various needs are compatible or nonviolent toward one another. I don't know if that's possible. And I just wonder about a kind of optimism around the common good or, or just wanted to hear more about what that means. Which is, I wanted you to hear more. That, I wanted to hear more about how the state fits into this optimism. And we've had this conversation before, because I think it's different to talk about community, common good, than to talk about the role of the state mm -hmm. in creating that. And that's where I think the, there's a slight disconnect, which is some of us do not have any faith in the state. <laughs> Right, right, and that, that to me is one of those kind of fundamental things that I, I need to understand if the state is supposed to be the um, guarantor of this relationship or are we thinking beyond that? And then the other thing that I think connects, um, connects the two of these is a question of, um, I'm gonna put it this way, um, when you're talking, I loved the idea of transforming all debt into, or certain forms of debt, into odious debt, illegitimate debt. Um, and Ariella's question about interest. Um, but what I was thinking is, we can, I don't know that that is a term that one can use, that that is necessarily compatible with odious debt, if it is illegitimate, because interest would make us revert to the same kind of extraction Right, that, that you're trying to get around and talking about odious debt. So, but where I do think about where that might take us is if we were to transform the dynamic that you're talking about in terms of debt, um, where there is a reversal of the obligation, right? By virtue of the fact that Europe is based upon Right, what it extracted. Its obligation is not to its own self-preservation, its obligation is to preserve those that they robbed. And that what would happen if we were able to actually be able to transform the logic of debt into a reverse logic of obligation. And so that's not about asking for forgiveness. That's not about, you know, there is no, there is no set of disparity whereby that person who, you know, <laughs> there's literally about, it's a kind of um, restorative justice approach. And so I was thinking about how that might be the thread between your talks. So. Um, I, I'm just jumping on this uh, state conversation, Wagen, so I wanted to ask before, and actually to tie it back to Patty's question, I'm, uh, I'm struggling also in, in this idea of getting rid of, of debt with the state also, and what is the role of the state, and, I'm, and maybe we're to link them both. I'm thinking about the way that uh, the, the unit of analysis, we might say in your talk, is, is nation states, right? The, the old, we can think about the AMF, we, we, we think about Europe, we're really talking about governmental and international co um, organizations' money. And, and I'm thinking about, for example, in the crises, to give an example, in the, crisis, the migrant crises in Central America last year up, up until this point, uh, Trump, his first instinct was to threaten uh, the, the three major countries, right, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, uh, to stop giving aid, right, to stop giving aid to these countries. And all of the, the, the response from the community organizers was, we don't care, that money has never got, gotten to us. If the U.S. stops giving money to the people, who, to these countries, these migrants will be in the exact same position. <laughs> and so when I think about for, uh, getting rid of debt, and the role of equality in these countries, I'm, I'm still stuck. I'm stuck because the we're th debt is, we're thinking in these terms, right? It is still being sort of laid out in, in nation state language. So I think that the, the, the role of the state in both, I'm, str I'm struggling, yeah. It's only right. <laughs> um, so thank you for these excellent questions. Um, 
first of all, I like to say, um, how are we thinking about the state, right? And for me, I, w I want to disambiguate the state a little bit, right? We're talking about laws, bureaucracy, the people, right? The people we know are distinguished in terms of race, class. Apparently there's a civil society. Um, there's representatives. There we vote, we have elections. There's the police. Um, there's ICE. There's interest groups. There's nonprofit organizations down the list, right? So, I mean, when we, when we talk about like the state, what are we talking about, right? You know, um, and so that's the, the first thing. So I, I want to disambiguate that. And then I also am really interested in thinking about the, like this ideal, is an ideal, right? An ideal of democracy and the ideal of equality. I am not, am I optimistic? about <laughs> equality and democracy. I mean, I guess I am, my project is premised upon it, <laughs> but it's more so as a tool to expose and reveal and to make clear the line, uh, to, to sort of imagine what would have to come and the kinds of problems that we would have to deal with even if we were to bring down um, the sort of white supremacist world order that we are faced with right now, right? And so for me, there are certain sort of enduring questions about how we live together and what our relationship to, should, would be to each other um, that are going to survive um, sort of, I don't know, revolution and, and sort of liberation. And so um, I think the ideal of standing in relationship to people as equals and really thinking about what that means, right? That we are different, right? So, so even to talk about equalizing people in relationship to difference is not, so it's not self-evident what that looks like, right? Um, but I do think that it's a powerful idea that no matter what difference you have, we stand before each other as a part of a collective endeavor of living together in a particular way that I can make claims on you and you on me in a way that does not involve my domination and subjugation. And it is that ideal that I'm saying can, may be able to be mobilized and to be thought around. Um, to, um, to sort of imagine what relations and practices in community with each other will, will look like going forward. Um, and also, another thing, it's like I don't, so for instance, Hartman um, in Scenes of Subjection tells us the story about emancipation for black people, um, for the you know, ex-slaves, that basically results in um, bringing about more complicated, um, more entrenched relationships of inequality, right? That there's something about the extension of equality that makes their unfreedom even deeper and, and more complex, right? And um, a part of what I'm trying to think about too is the ways in which sort of like um, that, that the way we talk about that, the fact that that's the case, sort of undermines sort of the project of equality altogether. And I don't want to go down that road, okay? So I'm like, yes, um, I, don't, I don't disagree that what she tells us about the emancipation is right. But like, why is that going on? Why is that happening? And I also think that there is a difference between, I'm like, you know, just thinking out loud with you. Thank you for letting me do this. Um, I'm also thinking about, um, like, there's a difference between um, a, a state or of dominators or whatever, right, who are committed to equality amongst themselves and a state of dominators that 
embrace an explicit project of domination. And that, and I, and, and, and the, and the thing that I want to, right, and, and what I want to say is that if you, if you sort of embrace an explicit sort of program of domination, what are the tools with which one can challenge those acts or to sort of make or, or sort of mobilize people in objection to those acts? I want to say that there's something about um, this, these principles about how we should relate to each other um, as ideals that can be used to help us imagine, um, to name the harm, to challenge it, to imagine what it looks like to relate to each other in ways that don't represent that. When you're sort of in a situation where there's sort of like pure violence and domination, and some people might say there is pure violence and domination, right? Um, I, I just think that there's something about um, having the resources of law and equality and um, in place that champion equality. Um, that was redundant. But there's something about having laws that are oriented around the principle of equality that is something worth preserving. And it is something that can be leveraged and used to build a more just world that I think that we should, um, we should think seriously about as a form of organization amongst people. Now, will those laws look like the ones that we have, that, are, that we're currently operating under? Um, will sort of the, the way that the state has been articulated survive and, and will it look the same way that it looks now? Uh, hopefully not, right? Like that's sort of the, the project of community making and political making um, that I want to leave the door open for and that I'm saying that um, thinking about uh, equality helps us, you know, sort of orient ourselves in the right way. And very quickly, sorry, I'm gonna shut up very soon. The common good for me or the interest of all, um, I don't think that we, I think that there's, if you are thinking about the whole, then there are certain things that can't, that, that wouldn't be legitimate if you were thinking about the whole or the entire, if you were trying to salvage the entire community, right? And um, it's thinking on those terms, right? That the, the body politic, including people in the, the decision making, like what it, if you are standing in equal relationship to each other, right? If we are doing that and we're making political decisions, um, we are thinking about the allocation of resources in order to maintain um, one standing as an equal, to maintain their status as a free person in the world then there would be certain distributions of wealth, certain distri uh, there, there would be certain living conditions that would be completely like off the table, I think. And these are the kinds of arguments that some, I mean, I sound very liberal, I know. Um, it, it is liberal. But um, yes, these are the things that I'm sort of thinking about and sort of um, slushing around. Um, where to start? Uh, well. I mean, I think the word obligation is interesting. I mean, if you actually look at the, at, at least, I didn't really look at the English, I looked at the Spanish. So when I look at the Spanish language definition of that, obligación is actually, like that's actually written in the definition. So I think that's an interesting way to think about it. Um, Sorry. Um, so uh, obligation is actually written into the definition of, of debt. So like in some ways, I, I feel like obligation is an interesting way to think about it. There are a couple of things I think are getting a little bit conflated. I mean, I don't, it's not that I don't think the state has any solutions, but certainly, I guess, um, you know, this work for me, I think, you know, thinking alongside Macarena Gomez Baris a lot is what I'm doing right now. Um, and the sense that like, it's like letting go of the idea that sort of certain left states in Latin America were going to fix something and like coming out of the fact that that pink tide like was 
went really fast to shore, I guess, and died. Um, so it's a little bit like thinking, oh, there's this thing that's gonna come out of a very particular moment of neoliberalism that's gonna help us, and having that be dashed is like kind of what I'm moving out of on, on some level. Um, but I think there are two things that go on, and I think I've probably confused them in some moment in this paper, which is there's, there's um, forget, forget, like canceling the debt that's being extracted from Latin America, and there's paying back the debt through extraction, and they're not the same, they're not the same thing, right? So it would, and in that paying back, it's sort of like, the paying back, then I don't know that that necessarily, I mean, I guess on some practical level, it would have to be in a conduit through the state, but I'm not sure I think about that paying back as opposed to the cancellation is moving through the state, if that makes sense. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, I mean, maybe what I mean to say is that, like, instead of saying, calling all sovereign debt odious debt, I, I want public acknowledgement that debt is odious. Um, so I, I guess in that sense, I'm, I'm thinking about that. But, you know, at the end of the day, right, I mean, all of these nations are all now tied up in terms of financiers. And I guess I have to go to the evil guy in the White House just to say, one must remember alongside this sort of like, oh, if you come here, I'm gonna take away my aid, which is different even than, than talking about debt, right? But if you remember during Hurricane Maria, right, one of the first things Trump did other than throw paper towels was to remind the Puerto Ricans that, oh, like basically, let, he reminds them that like they owe Wall Street some money. Like, and he doesn't say the U.S. He says Wall. He says some guys on Wall Street or something like that, right? So, I mean, the state is fine. I mean, is the state different from a set of elite finance capitalists? <laughs> I don't know. Do you, you see what I'm saying? Like, I would love that. Like, there was a separation between finance capital and the state. Like, because that would maybe allow me to have like a state that's. Like this, I could I could be a liberal maybe. I don't know. Like I could be a liberal <laughs> if that were true, but it's not true. So I can't be a liberal because the state is actually like a bunch of elites, and not just U.S. elites. It's like in every one of these sort of formerly colonized countries, right? You have a you know, it's like Carlos Slim. Like I mean, all these guys, right? And they're mostly guys. Um, have all the money. So the state is finance capital. I mean, that's the more scary thing, right? Like the state is sets of finance cap, like they're, they're just little pockets of elite rich guys, right? So I don't know that, that I guess that's it. Like, I think that is the state. And so I, I guess that's, that's where I would, I would, I would end talking. <laughs> if there are last questions, yes. Uh, can you help? Sorry. Yeah. So this is so exciting and interesting. And I actually, I have a question for Ainsley, but it is part of this larger question that we're trying to um, think through. And it's about maybe a tension between, fundamental tension between the idea of representation or representatives and democracy. So that in the context of the political landscape, right, theoretically, the representative is supposed to represent the interests of the collective and some, pro some idea of constituency that has to do with a common good. But of course, the notion of the single vote is constantly disrupted by eligibility for voting and the amplification of the access to the vote based upon wealth, right? So that it doesn't, there isn't actually sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence in the political arena, even if in the abstract it would be, and so we turn to the judicial, right, or the juridical as providing some protection, right, this sort of Madisonian democracy, tyranny of the majority and the like, but that is predicated on the individual case as a form of representation that is decontextualized for the purpose of analysis, right? So the individual case becomes representative of a principle such that you get things like, you know, the anti-affirmative action cases as being a sign of the lack of equality, right, for example. So, so that in both arenas, you have this structure of representation, and then you, that's not even adding sort of hypermedia, right, where representation doesn't, um, in some sense, 
obscures or interrupts the, pros the prospect of equality because it makes things appear, like if the idea of equality is that you treat like things in like fashion, but it makes you believe things are like that are not exact, in fact like, right? Um, and so for me the question is, because I do think that there's, your structural point is well taken, right? That there, that, that you know, there's one posture of critique that is really essential and robust, but what is the potential structure, right, that does something um, for a heterogeneous society that is meaningful? And I think for me, the, the, the actual, one of the sticking points besides capitalism is actually rep, what, rep, what representation is, in large part because of capitalism, but not completely. I would like to ask a question about what you've called the ridiculous language of financial capital. Um, which first of all is an awesome way to put that, uh, but also which I think is in some ways structuring the sort of idea of reversing debt um, in the sense that to reverse the relationship of, of indebted and debt collector is still to be working within a sort of epistemic framework of uh, financial exchange which is itself, of course, a colonial institution. Um, so I suppose my question is, do you see it as possible, and if so, do you see it as productive to sort of stay within the framework of debt in order to critique debt itself, or do you think that that is something that requires getting outside of language that implicates financial exchange if we're to do a critique of like capitalist structure specifically. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Ainsley, I, I really appreciate, you know, the clarity of what you're describing and what it did to me, listening to you respond to these questions, um, was make me think about my concept of adjacency and about whether or not we, those two things can exist can possibly exist in the same space or not. Because one of the things I was thinking about is um, that I have a notion of power, which is not about democracy, which is not about the state, it's about power, um, as a relation of forces that will always be in flux and always create a situation in which, right, there will be disparities, right? But that, and, and so, and that's what I actually feel like I have to embrace and live with. The perpetual um, disparities and reconfigurations of power that are not necessarily about dispossession, right? But are about the unequal relationship of forces that we constantly have to contend with. And so that's where I think I'm tripping up in terms of equality ever being something that is stable. <laughs> right? or that we can achieve because the nature of power is such that it will reconfigure in any moment. And so I guess that, that you know, my, my initial thought about the state was, was I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm revising that. Um, you know, albeit, you know, <laughs> albeit, you know, in terms of Imani's question around government, right, and governance. But I still, I realize that that's actually what I'm thinking about is, you know, the, the fundamental nature of power that will reconfigure the way in which, you know, you and I will ever be equal, right? So, so maybe I'll end with another question. Maybe I will, uh, what you gave up on the state. Uh, Patricia, back, back to you, sorry. Uh, I mean, you, you, rightly so, you said that you do, don't prefer the, uh, a financial capitalist on the state, but when I ask you about uh, interest rates, I ask it to you very, very seriously, assuming that there are crimes that are unpayable. This is no doubt. Uh, uh, I think that when we, uh, we can think about you know, forgiveness, not in a liberal way, but in a substantial way to account for imperial crimes, we have to dis distinguish between unforgivable, unforgivable crimes and nonetheless 
in a way make the world habitable again to uh, go back to Ensley and this, I don't know, maybe optimist uh, 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 or maybe dreamy way on, about democracy, I don't know. <laughs> but coming back, Patricia, to you, I think that the debt that you are talking about is not only the, uh, 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 you know, 72, is not only 1948 with the IMF. We're speaking about an ongoing death, right? So answering me with, uh, this is a way to ironize. I think that there is, in the Acuna's poem, it's, and in your presentation, it's much more than ironizing, right? It's really an attempt to uh, uh, see by ridiculizing uh, the debt, this debt, uh, uh, trying to go back to see how we can imagine a political formation in which it will be unforgivable. Uh, and not only it will be unforgivable, you will be free to, uh, to go back to governance formation that are not either or financial uh, uh, capitalist or the state which means the interest will be not monetary, but the interest rate will be you, IMF, will not intervene in our political space, right? That not only we have to cancel those debts that are payable, because there are debts that are payable alongside the debts that are unpayable. So not only there, there is a kind of claim to, make the, to cancel these debts, there is also a claim that you will not validate our political formations, and we can go back to pre-colonial political formations. This would be the interest in my eyes if we are potentializing history that are imposed on us, the, only the imperial terms, to imagine how we can go out of this debt and how we can go out of this debt, not only being humiliated that this, this payment, even if it will come, will not uh, 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 pay for them, but that, that we can recover other formations. Uh, I think that we have several questions. I'm sure that you have more. We will give both of you to answer uh, all these uh, thoughts and questions. And then uh, Vazira will say a few words to end our gathering. So we will take five more minutes, I think, from the time of all of us. Um, so, I actually think that you're asking the same question that Ariella is asking, right? Which is like, why stay in the language of financial capital instead of moving to a different formation? And ultimately, I think moving to the other formation is there. My, my fear a little bit, and maybe this makes me a little old-fashioned, is I'm, I'm afraid of, of skipping the step of undoing the sort of financial capital liberal language and exposing its violences before moving to what I might think of pre or decolonial. I, I, I wanna sit in that a little bit. I'm always afraid of pre's talking about non-European peoples, but, um, or not purely European peoples. I always worry about the pre because of the way that it, you know, primitivizes or, or takes people out of time. So pre is hard for me, but decolonial. I mean, I don't think that this paper is a decolonial project. I think it's an anti-colonial project. And I, I want to get through that because absolutely right. First, I mean, what would be the thought project of actually trying to figure out what the interest was on what was extracted? What would happen if you actually tried to quantify that, knowing that there are debts that aren't repayable and you cannot quantify? Like, what would it mean to actually quantify that and, and give that back to people to build sustainable lives? I mean, I think that's an interesting question. So in that sense, I think yes, but there's a danger of staying in the language of financial capital. I'm, I'm, I'm ridicule, I'm like the ridiculous in that I am ridiculing it, right? Um, to try to rob it of some of its naturalizing power. And like in this room, I don't think financial capitalist language has an especially naturalizing power. But I, I think in, there are, I'm in a lot of rooms in which it does, actually. And so I feel like there's something that has to happen there. I, I'm going to stop there, but I think that's, that's what it is. But I, I think this is just, this is anti and not decolonial yet, right? And, and I, I want to, I'm very committed to undoing the naturalization of, the, of debt to liberalism. I mean, that's actually really the project. <laughs>
Okay, thank you so much for um, thinking with me, as I said. So I'm very, this is a very early part of me sort of trying to make a case for equality to folks who are not just on board with that argument, right? So like, I see my, so like I think about Charles Mills, who starts black rights, right wrongs with like, look, um, liberalism and equality is a, you know, sort of important project, and I'm gonna stand on that and go from there. And um, I want to really think about the, why people want to distance themselves from equality and to challenge it and to think about the problems with the state and speak to them to make a case for why they shouldn't, right? Um, so that's part of my, my project, but I kind of cringe at the optimism part because it's not clear to me that trying to force this project won't end in violence <laughs> or won't end in revolution or won't end in state collapse, right? So, or totalitarianism, right? Like that's, you know, these are the conditions within which we're trying to, we're trying to fight these folks, right? And we're trying to fight people who are, um, who are violent, who don't respect human dignity, who um, basically want to dominate, who want to sort of steal all the resources for themselves. Um, like, what does it look like to produce a um, world order, particular kinds of communities, however you want to think about it, to basically take their power away to do those kinds of things, right? Like, what does it look like to think about um, power and our sort of notions of political community, um, democracy, all this other stuff, right? So, and, and, and sort of like political institutions, right? Um, so that's kind of like the thing that I have, I, I'm putting on the table. So I don't think equality is stable at all, actually. I think that it's something, it is a practice worth pursuing. And, um, and yes, power is a, I, I don't disagree with you at all, right? Like I don't agree, dis disagree with most of the people in this room and, and how you characterize the perils that we face. Um, to the question of representation, um, I am skeptical about the um, ability of representation to do the kind of work of orienting people in a political community in a relationships of equality. Um, and it is because they're not, they don't have to sort of deal with the, um, there's something about sort of like being, like that was kind of like the, the Rentian sort of story, right? About the, um, the inarticulate and, and sort of like the disengaged that um, are unaccounted for but are there and ready to be mobilized. And most of the times when we tell that story, in a, the American context, we're talking about like, you know, black and brown people who don't wanna vote, right? Um, but oftentimes, most of those people are, I mean, in political community and protesting and have all kinds of, you know, orientations to others, right? Um, and actually, this is a point that was made by um, Lester Spence like a long time ago at U Chicago in the bookstore. He was like, he doesn't worry about like black and brown folks so much as he worries about white folk, right? And so like those people who are disconnected and isolated and the ways in which then, and, and this is really my concern, like the ways in which certain taken common sense becomes something that can be leveraged to mobilize people because it explains the world and the conditions in which they live, right? And for me, that's a political failure to the extent that we're not sort of involved in the, you know, making and tending of the world that we live in enough to guard us against um, really crazy accounts of the reality that we share with each other. Um, and sort of like, you know, 
I am so being uh, so abstract right now. Um, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Like a two step yeah. phone? Okay. Because I think what's interesting, because I think I initially heard you making a structural claim as opposed to a sort of political or even ideological complaint around, um, um, claim around um, equality, which it sounds it's like it's more the latter. Thing. I don't think that they're disentangled. Okay. Like, I think that that's the thing. It's like the structure, opinion formation, our relationship to each other, how we this practice right. political community, right? All of these things are 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 um, are tethered together, and you know those are the kinds of things that we need to contend with and to think about if we're going to sort of um, yeah deal with the problems that we're faced with. And I think that equality is a, is a sort of principle that might be able to orient us in interesting ways to that problem. Um, I'm hedging my bets, and like I said, I'm being very abstract, and thank you for the engagement. Hopefully it'll help me get clearer. I get, I get the task of uh, uh, expressing the elephant in the room, um, but also just uh, on the note we ended, I think the move to abstraction uh, it came from a place where uh, what you engaged in was what our hope was for the last two days. And I want to thank each and every one here who has made an effort to come, some from long distance, um, and, and, and with, uh, with uh, considerable constraints. Those who are here, some who have left, uh, thank you so much for coming together into what has been um, a collective exercise um, of uh, world making, of, of, of um, creative and fierce uh, world making. Um, and the ferocity is what I wanted to sort of the, the, where you where you where where you lent yourself to um, uh, that uh, abstraction. It came from a kind of fierce and creative place, uh, for which I am very grateful. We are very grateful uh, for all of us having come together. Um, in in many ways, uh, the words uh, that we had made the call for reparations, redress, redistribution, resurgence, um, that we could invoke them, imagine them, what might have been, what we do in our own separative, deliberative communities, uh, coming together in relation to each other, um, a kind of expansive uh, possibility, uh, I want to say, um, uh, produced in some sense with when a pebble is thrown into a lake um, and uh, the ripples uh, that uh, emanate. Um, it is being truly heartfelt uh, um, and uh, moving uh, in many ways. Uh, to have this kind of reverberation um, in adjacency, stewardship, um, and potentially lived resurgence. Um, I'm also to add, uh, I would like to add, I know Aliyah has, has, has left, but uh, for those who, of us who gathered to organize, um, I wanna, I wanna call, shout out to Ariella in particular for showing in practice uh, what a uh, collaborative exercise like this, bringing it together could be like. Um, and a thank you from me to her for uh, the experience of uh, working together to make this happen. Um, and to uh, everyone, uh, we've already been thanking the people who make um, the logistics of these events possible the labor that goes into it, uh, but also the care that I think uh, those who are attending as audience and participating uh, that has gone into, into this uh, two days, in these two days.
Um, I also lastly want to say that Political Concepts is a journal, an online journal, um, and um, everyone who has presented a, a political concept over the last two days is invited to submit to it um, um, the version or a revised version um, um, of uh, their presentation uh, to the journal as well. And I'm sure uh, in, the, in the days to come, as, as we sort of, um, um, it sifts, sifts through our thinking um, um, with each other over the last two days, in the days to come, uh, you might uh, consider as we get an email about um, submitting to uh, the journal as well and continuing, I hope, the building of a vocabulary um, um, that is um, the practice of this conference and the journal. Thank you, everyone.